Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at, if we get there, I hope to get there through 12 verses today. Okay, by the way, notes are available. So we're starting to print them out. So if you go back on the back counter there, the welcome table, there's a stack of notes there. Uh, sometimes I go really, really quick. And I know I've been preaching for 25 years. We don't remember as much as we think we're going to remember, right? I forget stuff that I've preached about and spent time with, okay? I recognize that. So notes are there to help, okay? There's some points or there's something that sticks out to you. But my hope is that your heart and your mind will be open to hear from the Word today, right? And if you need to take notes, do that. If you're online, there should be posted somewhere in the chat room. You can download those. I tend to stick pretty close to them. <laughs> Sometimes I go a little bit off the trail, but that's okay as well. So those are available to you as well. By the way, welcome Bill Ginhart. You are back. Where are you, Bill? You are somewhere. Wave your hand. He's maybe in a different room. Bill is back from Africa. There he is back here. Welcome back, Bill. Thank you for your trip there. Thank you for coming back. And make sure you say hi to Bill. Uh, it is a lot warmer in Africa than it is here. He rested. He said it is so cold here. And so we're looking forward to some warmer weather for sure. Okay, so here we go. We're back in um, First Thessalonians. Okay, Here is a statement right out the gate that I want you to hear. Christianity is not a morality improvement program. How do you like that, right? Christianity, at its, at its essence, is not a way to get people to behave. It is a life transforming relationship with the living God. That's a good amen spot right there, right? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you, right? We love because he first loved, okay? He loves, so therefore we love because we have a relationship with him. We live because he is alive in us. Thank you. We know the truth because he is the truth. Now, our morality will change because His Spirit's in us, and we, uh, He transforms us to be like Christ. But ultimately, Christianity is about a relationship, restoring relationship with a living God, right? And unfortunately, we have all fallen short of God's glory, right? And you say, well, amen, right? We have, and that is a fallen condition of our heart. But thank be to God that he gives us grace, and he gives us his Holy Spirit, and he invites us to have a relationship with Jesus. And God transforms our lives, making us more like Christ through his Holy Spirit. Isn't it good news that you don't have to clean up your life on your own, right? The Holy Spirit transforms forms us. Often when I talk to people who are not Christians, they get to a point in thinking, well, I'm not worthy of receiving Christ. And the answer to that question is, you're right, right? This is not about your worthiness, about, but about God's grace, right? And his holiness. It's not like we have to clean ourselves up to be approved by God. You will never get the stain of sin off the, of your soul in your own effort, ever, Right? The only thing that cleanses us and makes us new and righteous is the blood of Jesus, right? His life for our life, His Holy Spirit, and His grace, uh, grace applied to our life. So in Thessalonians, right, and some of you are new here today, we're going through this letter and we'll be going through the second letter, 2 Thessalonians. Paul, the apostle, who was planting churches, who was concerned that the faith of these new believers would be strong and their love would be overflowing, has been, been torn away from them and is writing to them from Athens in a different place. And he found that their faith was true and he continued to encourage them about being focused in on the will of God and loving one another and being sound in their faith. He talked to them about who Jesus was and brought them the grace and the gospel. And we'll see that. You'll see that as you read his letter. And now we go into chapter 4 where... Paul then says, okay, now finally, you'll see that in your version. Today I'm using the NIV, and it says finally. Say, now that you understand this, I want you now to put Christianity into practice, okay? Becoming a Christian is the starting line of Christianity, 
right? You get baptized, and then it's time to live this out. It's time to display this. It's time to know Christ and then put his actions and put his life in our life that we become the hands and the feet. We become the body of Christ and his spirit works in us. And so Paul lays out all of this stuff for the Thessalonians and he says, okay, now let's talk about how to live. And that's the title of this message today. How to live. How should we live as Christians. Now again, it's through the power of his Holy Spirit and is by his grace and he helps us these ways. So this is what he says. And number one, okay, this is the first point. Aim to please God. You've heard this before. Okay, Thessalonians chapter 2 says, hey, make it your aim to please God. But again, I want you to put that as your primary focus as a Christian. Your aim is not to make money. Your aim is not to have a nice family. Your aim is not to have a good car or to be happy or be comfortable or get all that you want. The aim of our life as Christians is to please God. So let's read this. Finally, brothers and sisters, we instructed you, and this is where the title came, how to live in order to please God. God, as in fact you are living. Now, we ask you and we urge you in the the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Okay? Now, he's encouraging these believers who are already on their way, right? They're believing, they're gathering in groups, they're loving one another, they are strong in their faith, and it says, hey, God, I want you to continue to do this more and more, all right? And our aim needs to be, again, to please God. Now, what if, when you are facing a choice... You use the matrix or you ask the question, which choice here would most please God? You think you would make better decisions? The answer there is yes. Okay. This is how I want you, this is the question I want you to ask when you're facing, should I do job A or job B? Should I talk to this person or should I talk to this person? Should I watch this thing or that thing or so on and so forth? If we are asking the question, God, what would most please you? I will save, if we, I will save you a whole lot of grief in bad decisions. You say amen, right? When I don't ask that question, okay, I'm asking a different question. What do I want, right? And what I always want is not the best for me, right? Maybe you're better than me, right? Sometimes what I want is a big old cheeseburger at 12 o'clock midnight, right? Thank you. There's a good amen, right? Or I want to watch a certain movie that's a little risque. Or I want to just be lazy, right? Anyone here would just want to be lazy? Now, we have to have a day of rest, but that's not what I'm talking about. I know when I'm not asking that question, that's where I get into a place where I regret, right? Oh, I shouldn't have bought that, right? I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have watched that. I shouldn't have done that, right? And so often the world will tell you, well, do what you, what's best for you. The Christian ethic is do what pleases God the most, right? So God help us to ask that question. It's simple, but it's not always easy, but you're glad that you did. And even pleasing other people. Sometimes doing what your employer asks or your situation asks or your family asks, you can choose to please them, and you know what they want you to do, or you can choose to please God. And this takes guts. This takes courage. This takes power. From the Holy Spirit. So first thing as Christians, in how we are living our Christianity, we have to make it our aim to please God. 
We get in trouble where we say we know God, but we're trying to please someone else than God. And that gives God... <laughs> A bad name, so to speak. I saw a bumper sticker once that I really didn't like. But it communicated at least the heart of this person. It, it was a prayer. God, please save us from your children. That's scathing. So we have to say, God, will you help us to do what pleases you. And God, we know from his word, he wants us to love people. To act in grace, right? Grow in grace, grow in love. Stand in faith. And we'll get into some specifics as he continues to go through this for us. Okay? But if we were aiming to please God, we would not choose to be rude all the time. Self-centered. Self-pleasing. God, what pleases you? And if we do what pleases God, I'm going to tell you the after effect is that you will be most satisfied in him. Do you know that sin does not satisfy? Does anyone have this experience? I know none of you are sinners, but I am, okay? Right? Doesn't satisfy. It's fun for a moment, right? That's the hook, baby, right? But you start getting reeled in, right? I can't get no satisfaction. Does that sound like a song you know? But I try. But I try. I'm not going to sing. Oh, I almost want to sing, right? I can't get no. Right? Why is it that once you get something, it's not enough? You want a little bit more, right? And then you just want a little bit more. And then you want a little bit more. And then it eats your life. That's how it works. So, God, help us, number one, to aim to please him. We do that based on the, upon the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know his will by reading his word and understanding by the new nature what God has for us. So it says, number one, aim to please God. Number two, okay, live a holy and honorable life. Okay. That's a big ask. That's a big statement. So let's talk about this. Here it is, verse 3, part, the first part. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Sanctified. What does that mean? That means be made holy. So part of God's plan for us is to make us like him because it's the best thing for us. And that is to be holy. Holy, to be made holy. There's a process here, okay? And it, we become this because of his spirit in us. Because apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And you can say amen to that, right? We can't do it in ourselves. You and I are incapable of this. But God is capable. I'm going to give us three theological terms. Hopefully my slide is fixed. Number one, justified. Can you hit the next slide? Please work. Okay, they're all there, and that's fine. Justified, okay? Now, justified is a theological term, okay? And I, and, this, and I just said, I just made these up. Holiness declared, okay? Justified, when you become a Christian, okay, God gives you his spirit, and you are forgiven of your sins. You can say amen. <laughs> justified, it is a legal term that means that we are no longer guilty of our sin. Why? Because someone else paid the penalty of your sin. Because in the moment of you believe, you are justified, made right before God. This is holiness declared. You are declared holy. You are born anew. Okay? Born again by His Spirit. That happens the moment you believe, right? And we say amen to that. And now we go in a process, okay? And it's called the sanctification process. And this is holiness developed, okay? 
The best illustration I can give you for this is that God puts, uh, um, um, replants us, makes us new, like a seed into the ground, right? So if you have an uh, apple tree, which we understand, this is who you are. And we grow up, we grow into this. We become more mature, more like Christ, and we start to bear fruit, okay? Okay, see that illustration? This is who you are. Now there's weeds, right? And there's, there's problems, and there's all these things. And you see this specifically in John chapter 15, vine of the branches. Thank you, Pastor Solomon. He loves that, right? Okay, that we're tied to him. And as we are growing, we're becoming more like Christ, and we're bearing fruit. Now at times, do we need to be pruned? The answer is yes, right? Cutting things off that aren't very productive, cutting off dead parts of us, right? Do saints still sin? The answer to that is, yeah. It's the old nature, but that's not who you are, right? Who you are is new. Who you are is holy. And God says, hey, continue to live this out as, as you are. It is holiness developed. So in this life, we become more like Christ. We are living according to the new nature. Thank you, Galatians chapter 5, right? Now, we still have an old nature. Why do we still sin? Right? Because our old nature is here. And we have a choice to make every day. Am I going to follow the Spirit today? Or am I going to follow the flesh today? Sometimes we choose this, which isn't who we really are. And sometimes we choose that, is who God has declared us to be and who we are. So there is a process of sanctification. And he's talking about that. It's God's will that we should be sanctified. Ultimately, we're going to be glorified. That's holiness displayed, where we no longer have to deal with this sinful nature, right? Are you looking forward to that, right? Oh, my word. Paul talks about this struggle in Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. He says, I don't do what I want to do, and what I don't want to do, I do. Do you ever feel that way? Struggle. This struggle is real, right? It's real. That's what Paul most looked for. Well, I can't say that emphatically. One of the things that Paul most looked forward to is not having to struggle with the sinful nature. Right? Oh, that in itself is glorified. That in itself is enough for us to look forward to. So this is glorified holiness displayed. That happens when we hit the finish line on the other side. So after you have been saved, justified. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And then now Paul goes into, and he, he, he gets uh, very, very practical. Okay? And he addresses one area that's very uh, personal, it's a very important, and he spells it out, that you should avoid sexual immorality, right? Are we going to talk about that in here? Yes, we are, right? He's saying, now, uh, let me highlight an area. Now, sanctification um, happens. It deal, helps us to deal with anger and pride and greed and, you know, name, pick your poison, Right? Okay? All of this, but he goes specifically to this. It says, hey, in that culture, um, by the way, is, is sexuality a problem in our culture? Oh, you, you guys have picked that up? <laughs> we are getting more and more deviant as time goes on, by the way. Well, there's an amen. Come on. Right? And I don't need to tell us about everything that's available at our fingertips. Okay? It, ugh. It's a cesspool, okay? And we export this stuff to the, to the world, right? I remember when I was a kid, it was hard to find that stuff. Right? Now I carry it in my pocket on my cell phone, right? You guys know what I'm saying? Right? I'm glad it was hard for me to find it as a kid. Because I would have been full in. I'm just being real honest, right? But now, and look at where it's gotten us, okay? It's not a commentary. Well, a little bit it's a commentary on our society. Where does this go? Where are we going? And so Paul is saying, listen, <laughs> aim to please God. It's God's will for you to be sanctified. It's best for you. 
God is not a cosmic killjoy. He wants what's best and right and holy and good and satisfying for you and saying, hey, we have to avoid sexual immorality. Sex outside of the confines in which God declared it holy. One man, one woman in the confines of marriage. Holy. Go ahead and enjoy yourself, kids. Thank you, God, for that gift. But anything outside of that, it's not. And it hooks and it destroys and it demoralizes Good. So we as Christians should avoid sexual immorality. So the question is, how? 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 Right? I know this, right? but it's really hard. Right? So how are we to do this? Let's continue to read. And thankfully, he tells us how. That each of you, should, this is verse 5, that each of you should learn to control his or her own body in a way that is holy and honorable. That's where I get the point from. Not in passionate lust like the heathens. Those who not know God. Okay, that's what heathen is, an old-fashioned word. That's what that means, okay? So, we are to aim to please God, live a holy and honorable life, avoiding sexual immorality. How do we do that? Number one, by learning to control your own body. The, the sexual ethic of our day says that our body controls us. Hear me. It's the opposite. You have a responsibility to control your own body, not to let it control you. Hello? Just because you feel like that would be a good idea doesn't make it a good idea. You can see where this is going. Right? Well, I have an urge to sleep with that person. Doesn't mean you have to. Doesn't mean it's right. Well, follow my heart. What if your heart is wicked? Isn't that what the Bible says? I don't know. This is a problem in our society. In the name of freedom, we become slaves. Hear me. To our own desires. And then we, then we justify everything. And everything's okay as long as it's consenting. Really? Is it? By learning to control your own body, what does that tell us? God will help you to control your own body. God, will you help me to do this? If that's your desire, God will help you. God, help me. It's learning to control your own body. Right? We are responsible for this thing. Right? Holy Spirit helps us. Now check this out. Second, how do we do this? By knowing God. Right? Not in passionate lust like the heathen, heathen who do not know God. Knowing God gives us power to overcome passionate lust. Right? Now check this out. Holiness is not a matter of being free of sin, but being full of God. Okay. Often, we get caught in, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, and we end up doing what we're trying not to do. Here's a better way. To go after what you want to do. Because the default is if you're going after God, you will turn your back on sin. Right? So the best defense about helping to control your body is to go after God. Right? God, I want more of you. More of your goodness. More of your presence. More of your power. More of your strength. God, I want to know you. In so doing, we are getting farther and farther away from sin by default. So becoming holy 
as a result of knowing the Holy God. In so doing, by default, we will flee from evil. Being free from sin is not the ultimate goal. Knowing God is the ultimate goal. And in knowing God, He helps us to be free from things that will entangle us and bind us. Are you guys understanding this? Okay? I'm not telling you, oh, try to try to try to get better. Okay? No, get closer to God. Okay? And in so doing, it changes your appetites. And in so doing, you don't want that stuff anymore. Hello? Right? It's a process. Right? They say, well, I've been struggling with something for 45 years. Press after God. Get connected to Him. Learn to control your body if this is the area that you struggle with. Okay? So he tells us how. Number one, by learning to control your body. Number two, by knowing God. Here's number three, verse six, first part. And that in this manner, no one should wrong his brother, brother or sister or take advantage of him or her. Okay? Thirdly, by truly loving others. You know how many people have been hurt because of inappropriate sexual behavior? Not, not only hurts yourself, but then it hurts that person, and then it hurts the person that they're connected to. This is just not a private thing, but there are consequences to this. In this manner, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of of him or her. People use each other's bodies all the time. Take advantage of it. Just drink a little more. Drink a little more. Drink a little more. Okay, here we are. Taking advantage of them. Pray on one another versus praying for one another. This last couple of weeks, you have probably read the articles about a evangelist named Ravi Zacharias. You, you know him? One of the heroes of the faith for me, yeah. He's an apologist, written tons and tons of stuff. I listened to his stuff when I was, um, I don't know, 25 years old. Huge. Strong. You guys know him, right? Most of you know him? Ravi? Okay. Come to find out that as he was debating the leading atheists, as he was leading in a very um, intellectual and theological way, he um, took advantage of lots of women. Let's put it that way. Justified that his ministry was so um, strenuous, this is something that um, he had a right to. And he would pray on women who are most vulnerable, who are coming out of sexual abuse. Could you imagine that? And it hurts my heart that this happened, but it's even worse when it happens when someone who is internationally known for representing Jesus Christ. What you do matters. You don't live in a vacuum. You affect other people, and you affect those people that they're connected to, and on and on it goes. So it helps us to be sanctified, in particular in the area of sexuality, is to truly love other people. And truly loving them, we'd be honorable to them, and I do not want to damage them. I don't want to give them a horrible memory or a whatever, a disease, or blah, 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 or break up this relationship. There's so many consequences. If I was truly thinking about them, I wouldn't wrong them or who that person is married to. But we're not thinking that way when we participate in this stuff. We're thinking about us, and there's all types of justifications. Believe me, I have heard them. I've heard them. I've heard them. Heard them. I remember sitting in a car with a guy who was justifying his affair to me. I was a pastor. <laughs> he was trying to convince me that his affair was okay. 
I listened to him for a while, and then I stopped listening to him, and he listened to me. That's what happened. And I went to the, to the young lady, and I told her husband, talked to her. They repented. <clears throat> They're together still. He lost his marriage. He went into drugs. I don't know where he is anymore. Sad. But we try to justify. If we're thinking about other people, we wouldn't do this. Okay, let's continue on. Okay. <clears throat> Here's the next point. This gets scarier. The Lord will punish men for all such sins. <laughs> As we have already told you and warned you. <laughs> so how, what helps you to be sanctified is the next point, by fearing the Lord. The Lord himself will punish or avenge such sins. You don't want to mess with God this way. This is a promise. Okay. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And this punishment, this vengeance can come in various forms. One of them is God just gives you what you want, Romans chapter 1. That's what you want, okay. And we find out that this really isn't what we really wanted. One of the ways is exposing our sins, Luke 8. Or disciplining us. For there's a loss of reward. This is a promise. The Lord will punish men for all such things. So what helps us when you have this thought about, hmm, I just wonder? Wait a second. Does this please God? Wait a second. I need to control my body here. Wait, wait a second. What would happen if I did that with that person and all these things? Wait a second. The Lord will avenge this type of stuff. And there's a fear of God that keeps us from evil. This next line is from a man who lost his ministry because of some type of sin. And he says this. Can you go to the next side, please? <clears throat> Standing in the rubble of the consequences of your sin is a terrible place to be. Let that soak in a little bit. Standing in the rubble of the consequences of your sin is a terrible place to be. Because God loves us, he disciplines us. More scary is if you're continuing to sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and you haven't yet faced consequences. That's a bigger problem. They will come. It'll be brought to light. Well, nobody's going to know. Maybe people won't know, but you ain't fooling God. That's why being honest with each other and honest with God is so important. Here's the last thing, okay? And he, Paul gives us all these lists, right? And he says, hey, do this, do this, but he gives us help here. For God did not call us to be impure, thank you, <clears throat> but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man. Right? This isn't Paul the Apostle saying, oh, this would be a good idea. It's not your pastor saying, hey, you people got to be good. No, it's God who tells us. Who gives you his Holy Spirit. So how do we live sanctified? Lastly, okay? By relying on the Holy Spirit to empower us to follow the call, the call of God to live a holy life. You cannot do this in your own strength and power. Are you hearing me? So he gives us the Holy Spirit and so we can choose to walk in accordance with the Spirit or walk in accordance to the flesh. 
But because there's a Holy Spirit, God will empower us with his presence to do his will, to follow his call. Cuss. Holy Spirit, I need you. I can't do this. It's too great for me. Flee temptation. Holy Spirit, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about this person. God, help me renew my mind. That's how you battle this stuff. God, I want you. I want your holiness. I want to be honorable. I want to live as an honorable person. God, help me in this. That helps us. God, help us. And if you are stuck in this stuff, please talk to me. (laughs) Talk to someone. There's no shame, please. And I said that last week. There's no shame. Let's talk about this. Get you free from these things. So I'm going back to the main title so you can see how this put together. How to live. Okay. Number one, we live, we aim to please God. We do this by His grace. Number two, we look to live holy and honorable. Live a holy and honorable life. In particular, talking about the area of sexuality. Okay, Not to participate in anything outside of the confines of what God has declared holy. This is how you do it. Dum, 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 dum. And next, how to live. And now he's talking about two other things. And we're going to get to both of them. One, how are we to relate to believers? Second, how we are to relate to those who are outside of the faith? Next point. Love other believers more and more. Okay, let's read this. Now about brotherly love. We don't need to write to you, Thessalonians, right? For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And he was been commending them throughout this letter that you guys are doing this. He says, hey, keep doing this. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, the bigger area. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Those who are following God will love each other. Anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. 1 John 4, 12. (laughs) There is no such thing as an unloving Christian. I'm just going to let that sink, sink in a little bit. There is no such thing as and unloving Christian. It's an oxymoron. If you're a Christian, you are loving. And to be truly loving means that you are a Christian. There's no such thing as an unloving Christian. So he's telling them, hey, love the believers more and more. Now, everyone in this room, if I went to you, if I'd say, hey, do you love believers? You'll say yes. Okay. And so then I'll have to say, right, if you're a Christian, you say, okay, so what are we to do? Well, we're to love each other more and more. Well, how? Continue to tell each other you love them. Continue to give hugs. Right? Continue to provide meals. Continue to make phone calls. Continue to reach out. Shovel walks. Write cards. Right now, there's a lot of isolated and lonely people. That's an amen spot. What does that mean for us? This is where the church should shine. This is where, and by the way, um, um, statisticians and psychologists are recognizing that the people who are doing the best in this pandemic are those who regularly connect to a church. Thank you, Jesus, we're doing something right. right? Why? Because we're communicating to one another. Hey, if you have some time on your hands, 
I have a list of people who want to be here who can't be here. Okay? I will buy you cards and postage stamps. I will give you the list of our directory. Please write people letters. Right. Seriously. Send me an email. We'll do this. Okay? Okay. Love each other more and more. So, are we supposed to be concerned about ourselves? Yes. But it's not all about you. Right? All of this is for us, but it's not about us. For his name's sake, right? Have we talked about that? <laughs> so I want you to think about this week. How can you love believers more than more people here? People don't know. Have them over. Make a phone call. Shovel a walk. I don't know. Do whatever you think the Lord is leaving, leading you to do. So how do we live? We love other believers more and more. Send flowers. Hey, how are you doing, right, with that cancer? How are you doing with that recovery? Hey, how are you doing with the loss of your dad? Hey, how's it going, right? Hey, I've been praying for you and pray for people. Right? It's one of the ways that we can show love for one another. Literally, my wife and I every night pray for people. Every night. This has been something we've been doing for 25 years, ever since we've been married. Every night. It's a habit. Why? Because we love, and when you do that, you think about them. I make a note, hey, I need to talk to so-and-so. I need to check up with this. What is happening? We as Christians love the other believers more and more. They'll know that we are Christians because of our cross-point mugs. That's, right? Bumper stickers, we got them. Mugs, we got them. They know that you come here, but they don't know that you're connected to Christ. How? Because you love people? Well, I love people. Help us to do that more and more. So this is a good prayer. God, help me to do this. <laughs> help me to lend a meal. Help me to lend a hand. Help me to take a risk. Help me to bend a knee. Help me to be intentional. Be creative. Be persistent. Do this. We have a responsibility and obligation. That is why gathering together is so important. That's why hugs are important. That's why connection is important. That's why communication is important. Lastly, and this is my last point. <laughs> With believers, love them more and more. <laughs> Lastly, win the respect of outsiders. And this is what Paul is telling us by his spirit. This is how you are to live, by the grace of God. <laughs> Aim to please God. Live a an holy and honorable life. Love the believers. And God, help us to do that. Third, fourthly, excuse me, win the respect of outsiders. Here he goes. Verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. <laughs> to mind your own business. And to work with your hands. Just as we told you. So that... Your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. So we work hard. We mind our own business. We lead a quiet life. Not so that our life will be better, but so that God will be glorified. Do you catch this? Not so our bank account will be bigger. Not so our fence will be taller. <laughs> Not so our grass will be greener. We, greener. we do it because we want to glorify God, to win the respects of outsiders. So if you want to win the respect of people who aren't in the faith, does anyone here know anybody who's not in the faith? Anybody? We all do. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully you do. Right? Hope your family is saved. I hope everyone you know knows Christ, and so then you need to meet more people. Right? So what are we to do with them? <clears throat> Lead a quiet life. <laughs> Not always living loud. I'm just going to put the context of my, my neighborhood. Okay. We now moved um, a mile away from here about three years ago. The place we had before, we had much more space. The place where we're at now, I know what music my neighbors listen to. I'll just put it that way. Which is great, honestly. I'm so glad we live in the community we live in. You know why? Because people open their doors to us. Typically, people with money don't want... They, they have money because they buy them space. And they don't want to interact with people. Uh, this is what I found. So I'm in a neighborhood that there's less money, 
It has been great for the gospel. Put me there. People have needs. So people in our neighborhood know that I'm a pastor. You know why? Because I told them. But I didn't tell them right away. I told them after I got to know them. It's it's funny, isn't it? (laughs) I didn't tell them. You know what I first did? Knocked on the door, hi, we're new neighbors. Introduce yourself, anything we can help you with. Know what I told them? I have a snowblower that was given to me. It's old, it's crusty, it's been repaired, but it works. Guess what? My neighbors don't have snowblowers. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I should talk about negative stuff to me. I don't always get it right. I blow their snow as a, a, a way to show them love. To know that it's not just, I can just go do my driveway and go sit down and like suckers, they have to shovel. <laughs> sit there with my tea and my Bible. Boy, that looks heavy. Right? Come on. Blow their snow. Watch their kids, bring them cookies. How we watch everybody's dogs. We don't like dogs. Well, maybe. Yeah, that's right. I really don't like cats. We're not going to talk about that. Oh, our, our film guys, I'm going to try to keep here. Um, got a little time. When the respect of outsiders. That means live a quiet life, which means, for me, don't blur my music all night long. Right? And sometimes I like music loud. I keep to myself. Don't be a busybody. Anyone have any busybodies on their neighborhood? In their work? In their family? In the church? Always in everyone's business? In your apartment complex? Come on. Construction sites? Thank you. Yeah, exactly, right? Oh, man. Busybodies. You ain't winning any friends and influencing people. You're not winning any respect. Work with your hands, that means work hard, right? Just work, right? Work. Just work. Be good at what you do. Why? Ultimately, because you want to glorify God. That's why. That's how our work ties in with our Christianity. In everybody's business. If I went to your workplace and I said, hey, hey, tell me about Paul Dixon, what would they say? Tell me about Joel. Hey, what, what do you guys, what, what about Joel? What will they say? I like Joel. Why? Because he shows up on time. He's respectful to everybody else. He's good at his job. I respect Joel. And that opens the door for Joel to share the faith of Christ. You guys see how this works? Right. So again, this is not about a morality improvement process. It's about showing a holy and living God. And when he interacts with us, he changes us. I'm, I'm not as I once was, but I'm not yet what I will be. Right? You like that? Well, let's move that direction. Right? And we need God's help, right? Everyone in here will say, yeah, amen. Right? So we're going to pray for God's grace in this, right? And I'm um, coming for a conclusion, and if the worship team could come up, that'd be cool. <clears throat> and I'm going to pray for us. God will help us. I'm going to repent for me. You might need to repent for you, okay? Say, okay, God, help me to be so in love with you that I don't want to do anything that damages your reputation, right? You guys catch that? Oh, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to take advantage of anybody. I want to do that. God, may I be so in love with you that people, when they see me, they'll see you. Right? So I'm going to pray that way. Aim to please God. Live a holy, honorable life. Love the family of believers more and more. Win the respect of outsiders. That's enough for us. Right? So let's pray. <clears throat> God, first and foremost, thank you for your precious spirit that is with us. Thank you for your empowering presence. Thank you for your transformational grace. God. Second, thank you for these precious people in this church. God. 
precious. Those who are hearing my voice online, viewing this later, those who are here in this building, they're precious to you, who precious to me. And God, we thank you for um, baptisms that take place. We thank you for new birth that happens, God. Thank you for this community. And God, I ask that you would help us to love each other more and more. And God, we need your help to live holy and honorable, to win the respect of outsiders, and to live in a way that honors you and pleases you. Thank you for the grace that helps us do that. Thank you for the invitation that helps us do it. Thank you for the life of one who did it perfectly, who is Jesus Christ, and now living in us by your Spirit. Forgive me, God, for not always representing you in a way that is honorable and right. Forgive me first, God. Forgive us, your church and the church. We ask for more grace. And God, help us to see you clearer. God, help us to love you deeper, Lord. Help us to do these things in a way that honors you until you make all things new. <laughs> you are worthy. People honor and praise and glory. You are worthy of our very lives. We are desperate for you and we're grateful to you. Conform us into the image of your Son. Make us obedient to faith for the sake of your name among all the nations, God. May your spirit be so evident here. People will say, hey, look how they love one another. <laughs> Help us to do that. For your namesake, in Jesus' name.